I'm going to start with what I would call the uh, events, uh, the, the, uh, the something's rotten in the state of Denmark kind of events for psychology and neuroscience. Um, and, then, and then I'll start moving, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just going to lay those out there. We'll come back to what's going on underneath them. <laughs> but at the start, I just want to sort of lay them out there. And, and you should have this response of, okay, something's not quite right <laughs> going on here. Um, the first one of these Martha mentioned yesterday, um, which was in 2009, uh, a paper was published. Um, the original version of the paper uh, was called Voodoo Correlations in Neuroscience. Um, and the, the main point behind that paper was that there was quite a number of study, neuroscience studies that were claiming correlations between brain activity and personality that were in principle impossible because the claim was that brain activity was more correlated with personality than brain activity, than we knew that brain activity was correlated with itself, or that we knew that personality measures were correlated with themselves, that these correlations were higher than the reliability of the two independent measures. And so something's going on here. Um, also in 2009, um, there was a poster at the Organization for Human Brain Mapping that reported that they put a dead salmon in the scanner and asked that dead salmon to take the perspective of other things and that there was significant neural activity in that salmon's brain that differed between uh, when it was asked to take the perspective of other things compared to um, uh, when it wasn't asked to take the perspective of other things. Again, this should be on its face impossible, right? Um, but nonetheless, they were able to, um, uh, 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 you know, they, you know, they, they were able they were able to report this. We'll come back to why later, but the, but this again uh, uh, is just a you know something's not quite right here moment. Two years later. Um, the premier journal uh, in the field of social psychology published a paper with nine separate experiments that again, like the dead salmon poster, appeared to be playing by exactly the same rules as everyone else in psychology was playing by. And these nine experiments purported to show evidence for precognition. So an example was people were uh, able to know ahead of time which of, two, uh, um, uh, uh, which of two sides of the screen an erotic picture would be on. They could predict in advance, apparently, um, uh, uh, in this study, um, oh, in advance, which, 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 which of the two sides of the screen um, that picture would appear on, and other you know, purported evidence for precognition. And then the same year, uh, Joe Simmons and colleagues um, uh, published an experiment um, in, uh, uh, in another uh, prominent uh, psychological journal uh, claiming that, and you know, this again doesn't make sense, this is supposed to be jarring what's going on, they again appeared to be playing by the same rules that everyone else in the field of psychology is playing by. They report their experiment and the, and the, exper and the experimental claim is when you listen to the song When I'm 64 by the Beatles, listening to that song makes it more likely that you will report that you are younger than you actually are compared to not listening to that song. Again, there appears to be a, you know, the claim was, you know, playing by the same rules that psychologists play by, I can show that listening to this song actually makes you younger. We've discovered the fountain of youth. Um, now, there's some differences across these um, examples, and I'll come back to what I think is happening in each of these examples. But what I want you to get is, gosh, there seems to be something awry um, uh, with kind of the standard set of rules in the field if all of these things you know, can be published by the standard set of rules in the field. Um, in some cases, so in Joe Simmons' case, the, the paper, you know, he knows what's going on. He's trying to make a point about the standard set of rules, right? So he doesn't actually believe in the fountain of youth. 
Um, in Daryl Ben's case, I think he actually believes in precognition, but in terms of what's going on in those two reports, I think probably something very similar is going on in terms of why it is that we're able to get these results that, that we just know a priori are impossible. Um, these kinds of reports led people to, uh, um, uh, recently in the last five years, start to evaluate both the, um, the sort of standard set of rules by which science is done by, but also to sort of ask, okay, well, if, if this kind of extreme stuff can happen, so people can um, uh, uh, report things that we know are a priori impossible, um, you know, what, you know, let's, let's go back and ask, you know, what, what, what um, how replicable are the past findings that we've had in our field? Let, let's evaluate. You know, we've been playing by this one set of rules. Um, you know, what, what are we left with in terms of, of how replicable the scientific findings are? Um, and there, there have been a number of replicability projects now. Um, I think it started, um, we should give psychologists credit, it started in psychology, and I think they're leading the vanguard here. Um, and uh, the, in 2015 was the um, uh, Reproducibility of Psychological Science Project. They looked at a hundred different studies that were published in the top psychological journals. They picked a couple, one in social psychology, one um, in uh, sort of general psychological science. Um, and what's shown here is just, you know, this is the original effect size in those hundred studies. Um, this is the replication effect size. So what they did was they just, it was team science. They got hundreds of scientists across the country farmed out these hundred studies and said, okay, you do this one over again, you do this one over again, you do this one over again, and let's evaluate, you know, can we just do exactly the same thing that we, <laughs> that's reported in the literature and get the same answer? Um, the take home, you know, you can, you can assess replicability with, lo with lots of different metrics. That's a whole technical discussion in and of itself. Like, what does it mean for a finding to replicate? Um, this is one uh, kind of assessment, like, how big was the original effect size? How big is the replication effect size? And you can sort of see, you know, there's some things where they're about the same, and then there's a whole bunch of other studies where, you know, it's almost zero now, even though originally it seemed to be a big effect. Um, and the take home from the um, uh, uh, replicability of psychological science was that somewhere, you know, less than 50 out of 100 studies, um, depending on how you want to say, you know, what a replication is, replicated when they asked these groups across the country to do the same thing over again and do we get the same answer. Um, this is not just a feature of psychological science. I've said there have been replicability projects in other fields, um, and I think you know, the number goes up or, or down depending on the field and depending on the journals that are selected and all of these other things, but it never gets to a point at which scientists would be like, okay, we're feeling good again, <laughs> right? It might, it might go a little bit up, it might go a little bit down, but if we're around 50%, like that's, that's sort of a worrying or less, that's a worrying level. Um, uh, another prominent example around uh, that actually happened a little bit before um, uh, the Psychological Science Project, um, two, uh, 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 two pharmaceutical companies um, uh, sort of opened up their uh, internal um, uh, 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 research results um, and revealed that uh, in one case, in Bayer's case, they revealed that there were 57 different uh, studies that they that were in the literature. This is the, both of these are in um, uh, uh, preclinical cancer um, uh, research, so research in animal models trying to find um, uh, biological processes that are relevant to treating cancer and developing anti-cancer um, treatments. And so Bayer reported that they had tried to replicate 57 preclinical studies and could only replicate 11 of them to the point at which, you know, what they wanted to do was invest money in trying to develop a cancer treatment. Um, and only 11 out of 57 cases were they able to replicate them. Um, Amgen reported around the same time that they had tried to replicate 53 landmark preclinical cancer studies and could only replicate six of them. Um, so, I think, you know, this is now <laughs> the, what the, when we talk about the replicability crisis or the reproducibility crisis, this is, this is what we're facing. Um, this um, level of reproducibility or replicability is much lower than I think 
before these data started coming out, scientists would have given you if you sort of asked, you know, how replicable is this? You know, they would have had some, well, yeah, there are certain things that get published that probably aren't true, um, but they would have been, I, I think this shook a lot of fields, including psychology, um, to be confronted with this. And so, so what's going on here and what can we do about it? Um, I think the diagnosis is that this uh, replicability, they're, they're, it's a multifactorial, it's not like there's just one uh, 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 cause of the reproducibility crisis, and so there's not just one uh, solution, um, but we've identified a number of different um, uh, causes and at least a number of different potential solutions um, that have been implemented. Um, uh, again, I think psychology is really the vanguard here, psychology and, and neuroscience to some extent. Um, so what are the problems? One of the problems is publication bias and the file drawer. So to get a study published, typically journals are more interested in publishing studies that have positive results than studies that say we did something and it didn't work. And so what that means is that oftentimes scientists will do studies, it won't work, and then they won't publish them. And so what that means is that the literature is not necessarily representative of the set of scientific studies that have been done. So if you look at the literature, you're assuming more things work than scientists actually know have worked or not because the stuff that doesn't work gets put in the file drawer. And when you combine this with the fact that any given study there are a number of choices that scientists make at every point in time about when do we stop collecting data? Do we use this measure of impulsivity or that measure of impulsivity? Do we use this way of correcting our um, uh, brain data from multiple comparisons or that way of correcting our brain data from multiple comparisons? Do we, do we look at the relationship between X and Y or X prime and Y prime? That there's, um, a number of, this, this gets described in different ways. Um, if you're being less charitable to scientists, you say, well, they're sort of data dipping and p-hacking and they're trying a bunch of different analytical ways until you get an answer that's um, statistically significant that's a positive result that you can publish. I think probably a fair way of saying it is just that there's a garden of forking paths that you make in your analytical choices, um, and that you know these multiply, right? Every one of these either are choices. You get you know another times two possible ways in which you could have analyzed it, and um, oftentimes this, there's no um, you know it's not like there's any intentionality on the part of the scientist to try and you know direct this to a positive result, but. We're fundamentally interested in the positive results and the patterns that we see in our data. We can sometimes see patterns that will fool us. And given that there's these, this, this sort of multiplex of different ways of analyzing our data, um, it's hard to know whether we're, you know, have we discovered something that's really a true effect in the data or have we just somehow found our way into a forking path that's just one of these, you know, false positives. And so I think um, the, uh, this, uh, it's this experiment or degree, this is a freedom slash the garden of forking past that I think is probably what's going on in the case of the precognition study and it's definitely what's going on in the case of Joe Simmons' study. The Simmons study was, was, was designed to make exactly this point. They were trying to be as dastardly as possible, right? Like they were trying to find what's the one of all these forking paths. What's the one that gives us the most crazy possible statistical result, right? And so they found the one that showed that listening to the song makes you younger, right? To make this point that like if we want to find something in our data, we can, and so we need some ways of protecting ourselves against. Um, sort of searching through the space just to find the one thing that, that's uh, statistically significant. And so I think in, in response to those uh, problems, the kind of solutions that have been proposed and that are now being implemented um, in the field um, 
One, which was the solution that the, the Simmons paper, the 164 paper, was, was arguing for, is just better quality reporting and disclosure of what you've actually done and haven't done. Right? So the point they made was, you need to report, and, if, and before this it wasn't necessarily the standard in some fields, to report, you know, here's all of the data we collected, here are the conditions that didn't work, as well as the conditions that did. Here are all the measures that we collected, right? So sometimes you would just say, well, I looked at X and Y, and you wouldn't reveal, I had 64 other measures that I collected in that data set. So it's like, okay, here's all the measures we collected, here's all the data we collected, um, and uh, you know, here, here are the control variables that we put in our model, and here are the ones that we didn't. Um, so this gives you a sense of the choices that the analysts could have made, so you get some sense of the degrees of freedom that the experimenter had in their analysis. Even better would be not just to report this, but also to provide the data. Um, and so again, there's a big movement to open science practices in terms of uh, not just reporting what you did, but then providing the data so that other people can go back and say, well, how sensitive is your result to different analytic choices? Um, uh, both the, the data that you gathered as well as the code that you used to analyze it, right? And so there's a big push to both having the data be openly available as well as the code. Um, again, as a check on the different um, you know, uh, choices that the analysts made, um, you know, is your uh, conclusion uh, uh, sensitive to making different choices? Um, there's also a push towards pre-registration. This is basically tying your hands with respect to the, the analytic choices that you're making. So committing ahead of time to, I'm going to use this statistical procedure, I'm going to use this variable rather than that variable, I'm going to define the variable this way rather than that variable, the variable that way. This is something that um, you know, has, has been kind of mandated in the clinical trials literature and is now sort of moving into you know, preclinical pre literature, into the psychological literature where people, again, it, it's <coughs> cutting against the experimenter degrees of freedom and the garden of forking paths problem. If you committed ahead of time to this is the way you're gonna analyze your data, then we can know that it wasn't like you tried 64 different ways, you just did the thing that you said ahead of time you were gonna do. Um, and finally, uh, uh, registered reports. This is a way of um, doing replication, um, uh, uh, a way of cutting against the file drawer problem, where people can say, uh, look, this is the question that I'm interested in, this is the method that I'm going to use, and the time at which it gets reviewed is not the time in which you write the report and say, here's what I found, isn't that so exciting? Where you can be sensitive to, where now the evaluation is, well, is what you found that exciting or not? I don't know, maybe it shouldn't be in this journal because it's not exciting enough. Now the review gets moved up to this stage where it's, is the question that you're asking exciting or not? Mm -hmm. um, and so you get reviewed at this stage, the decision about whether to publish is at this stage, and then, you know, regardless of whether you get a positive result or a negative result, it's then into the, it gets into the literature. Um, uh, just a couple more, uh, I think there, there are a couple more problems to, to gather. And I'll then, try and wrap up um, in the next few minutes. Um, so, you know, one question is, this is all great moving forward, but we have all of this stuff published, and how do we know what's reliable and what's not reliable? Uh, and I think people are, are really working hard on trying to develop statistical methods um, that can uh, assess whether a set of uh, past results likely represents true effects versus likely represents false positives that just happen to you know, uh, uh, get into the literature because they were positive results. Um, and uh, uh, one of the better methods that I know of was developed by Urs Amundsen, um, who at the time was here at Penn, um, called the P-curve, which is a way of evaluating a set of results, um, looking at the um, statistical, um, and, and it's a statistical method for saying, you know, on average, I think this uh, literature with this set of results, 
uh, likely has true effects in it, or on average, I think this literature, you know, probably is just all false positive. Um, those are not uh, the only problems and sort of sources um, of the um, replicability crisis. I think there's also um, uh, issues in terms of uh, uh, statistics and our intuitive ability as statisticians. Um, one thing here, it's interesting, it's that for those of you who read Danny Kahneman's book or read the uh, Michael Lewis book about Kahneman and Tversky, um, the very first paper that they ever published, uh, which was sort of the start of their collaboration together, was actually about, uh, they called it the belief in the law of small numbers. And it was actually about how psychologists reasoned and about their own data. And the phenomenon that they identified was that psychologists like, and, and scientists like humans tended to have this erroneous belief that small samples were representative of larger populations. So for example, if I asked you, if I asked most people to generate a random sequence of heads and tails, what they would give you is something like heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, right? And what that, what that tells you is that people believe that at the level of eight samples from a coin, that there should be four heads and four tails, and even more at, the, at, at four samples from a coin, that there should be two heads and two tails. And at two samples from a coin, one should be heads and one should be tails. And obviously, statistically, that's just not true at all. And if you think that small samples are representative of large samples, this was their point, then your reasoning about power in psychological experiments would be, of course, we can do experiments with small numbers of subjects and reason about the larger population because the smaller number is representative of the larger population. And if I do a study and I see that there's this effect in 10 people, then I should believe that there would be this effect in this larger number of people. Um, and that that kind of reasoning about the representativeness of small samples may be at the, the point is that that, in terms of the applicability of the replicability crisis, is that that, um, maybe one of the reasons why um, we run underpowered studies, right? Because we think underpowered studies are more representative than they really are. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of things that I've just uh, filed under statistics is hard, um, especially with respect to neuroimaging data. There's lots of thorny issues about independence and multiple comparisons correction. And those issues about voodoo correlations and um, uh, and the activity in the dead salmon, those are all issues about, you know, the, uh, that, that, that properly, that finding the right answers in terms of what are the statistical procedures that will control false positive um, rates is not a, you know, just easy <laughs> um, uh, 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 thing. We actually have to sometimes, you know, uh, uh, really um, test out the procedures that we're using um, and show that they properly uh, correct the false positive rates, and then sometimes we discover that they don't, and then have to figure out what to switch to. And so there, I think the answer for both of these is really coming up with better standards. So better standards with respect to power. Um, what you see in all psychology and neuroscience studies over the last 10 years is an increase in sample size across the board, and that's because people have discovered, oh yeah, no, we, we were running underpowered studies, we really need to have a larger sample in order to make um, uh, um, valid conclusions, um, and better standards in terms of, you know, especially in our imaging statistical procedures. So the voodoo correlations paper led to a change in how people reported, could report um, those kinds of correlations. The dead salmon poster led to a change in how people um, uh, uh, did multiple comparisons corrections. There's been changes since then where people have said, oh wait, it's still not working as well as we want it to. Um, but again, the, the answer here is, is implementing better standards. So I'll leave it at that. I think I left a couple of minutes for questions. <laughs>